Babe. Babe. Why is it so damn loud? Yeah? For real. It would not. It, I, I can't even. It was doing like the power off button. And it wouldn't do anything. The volume just kept going on by itself. It was crazy. You're crazy. Okay. Sorry. The fuck, man? Hello and welcome to Where in the World, the Eye of Dread. Whether you're new or a returning cardinal, welcome to the channel. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like what you hear and see today. The music, ambiance, and sound effects you will hear throughout this video are brought to you by Artlist.io. Be sure to check out their services, especially if you're a content creator like myself. If you sign up for a year-long subscription using my affiliate link down below, you get two free months on your year-long subscription, aka 14 months. Now with all that said, let's go ahead and jump into this thing. You see, the Eye of Dread holds a special place in my heart because it was the reg region where I chose to GM my first second edition campaign, which is what I would call a Galarian homebrew, uh, The Rise of Razmir. Uh, if you don't want to hear about it, you can go ahead and skip to, uh, or actually this uh, chapter right here. But I do urge, I do urge you or ask that you stay around. It's actually a pretty interesting story. I can already hear the comments section saying, Well, Liam, the Rise of Razmir isn't in the Eye of Dread, you big doof. I know that. Since the bestiary came out alongside of the core rulebook, you know, like all tabletop games should. I'm talking about you, 5e. E. Shame. The bestiary had written rules about how to make NPCs and characters vampires. So I designed a campaign that predominantly took place in Uslov, where the players knew that they would become vampires whether they liked it or not, but they didn't know when. They could not choose caster classes or, ca or classes that could use magic, because for those that don't know, vampires have fast healing. The hit to your max HP may seem rough, but because you're able to wait for a minute or less and your HP be completely regenerated, I thought it was pretty fair. You essentially could breathe out the bullets like you wouldn't in Call of Duty after waiting a few seconds. Either way, <clears throat> the players were in Uslov and had to reunite the counties and reform Uslov into one nation, uh, as, they were, as the nation was once in the past. It doesn't sound all that bad until you add in the fact that Uslov's biggest problem is undead and the players were vampires. So you do the math on how calculated and complicated you think that was. Uh, the party eventually uh, started having talks with nations all around Lake and Carthen. It was actually pretty awesome. I would upload the sessions to uh, YouTube and Podbean except that I used a lot of copyrighted music which would get the podcast and the YouTube pretty much flagged indefinitely. Uh, thanks for listening to me reminisce about my past campaign, but it is what made me fall in love with 2nd Edition, and hopefully you will too. Let's get into the Eye of Dread. First of all, we have the nations within the Eye of Dread. We have the Bellskin. We have the Fangwood, or I should say... We have uh, nations and places of interest. So we have the Bellskin. We have the Fangwood Forest. We got the Gravelands. We got the Isle of Terror. We have Molthoon. We have Nermathos. We have Oprak now, which we didn't have in first edition. And we have Ustalov, my favorite. When it comes to the peoples within the Eye of Dread, we have dwarves. We have goblins. We have half orcs. We have Kelid. We have the Talden, and we have the Varisians. Uh, one they don't have here in the World Guide, uh, we also, of course, because of Oprak, we have Hopgoblins. So, next, we have the languages that are most commonly spoken here in the Eye of Dread. We have Common, we have Goblin, we have Halit, we have Necro, Orcish, and Varisian. 
Um, another fun fact, uh, what I did with my, or I shouldn't say fact, uh, one thing I did with my players once they became vampire was it was kind of like an innate um, learning of the language they had because they were now undead. I thought those were fun little twists. Anyway, <clears throat> we now have also, we also have the, uh, the factions. We have the Esoteric Order of the Palatine Eye. We have the, please don't butcher, or please don't execute me in the comments. We have the Magambi, uh, Magambia. That's how I'm going to pronounce it. And last but not least, we have the Whispering Way. So, when it comes to the religions within the Eye of Dread, we have Desna, we have Orostal, Iomade, Phrasma, no surprise, especially in Uslav, Rovagug, and Urgothoa, which, no surprise in Uslav. <clears throat> Resources. We have armor, weapons, books, lore, grain, fruits, vegetables, jewelry, gems, livestock, hides, lumber, mercenaries. I'll go back to that one here in just a second. And ores. The Eye of Dread is one of the only... Uh, I believe it's one of two regions in the entire, uh, in all of Galarian, that actually have mercenaries as a resource. Uh, fun fact, Ustalov does not have a standing army. Uh, and again, that was one of the biggest challenges the players had to face too, was if they're going to reunite a nation, people want to make sure they're protected, and all these nobles want to make sure they're protected and all that fun stuff. But anyway... For notable figures, we have the Overlord Ardax of, or Overlord Ardax, the White Hair. Uh, his little uh, tidbit here, which, by the way, I'm reading out of the Pathfinder World Guide. So, uh, the Overlord of Ugir, Ardax controls access to Urgir and oversees negotiations between Belzken and their neighbors, the orcs to the north of Ustalav. Then we have General Azerzi. General Azerzi, founder of the Iron Fang Legion and now ruler of Oprak. General Azerzi works to establish a hobgoblin homeland and secure the resources of the Onyx Vault. So, yes, the hobgoblins are led by a female. Power to the ladies. Power to the ladies. Then we have the Imperial Governor Marquin Teldas. Uh, the Imperial Governor of Molthun focuses on expanding the citizenry of his nation in order to strengthen it. Pretty like like any ruler would. Um, but Kino, obviously, he's the he's the Imperial Governor of uh, Molthun. And last but not least, the legend, the one, the Whispering Tyrant. This guy, Tar Buffon, otherwise known as. A resurgent villain who has challenged gods, slaughtered saints, and amassed armies. Tarbophon is the greatest current threat to Avistan. Yeah, the dude is, um, he's really strong. <laughs> he's really strong. Uh, you know, he, he, yeah, he's big brain too, which makes it worse. And he, uh, almost brought Uslav, well, he brought Uslav to its knees for many, many, many years. And that's one of the biggest reasons Uslav has such a, uh, a hate for the undead. Wife brought, wife brought me some hot cocoa. Can't pass that up. So, and now we move on to the reading. So, we will begin on page 38 of the... A Lost Omens World Guide. Blood and conflict have been facts of life in North Central Avistan for centuries. And with the recent collapse of the valiant Crusader nation of Last Wall, the area is even more dangerous. Though many perils haunt these war-torn lands, among the deadliest is the Lich Tar Buffon, or otherwise known as the Whispering Tyrant who has recently re-emerged to threaten the region once more. The wizard King Tarbophon first rose to prominence around 850 AR. His mortal life is shrouded in myth and legend, but he mastered necromancy and drew the attention of the god Aridin himself. 
In 896, the two clashed on the Isle of Terror, where Tarbophon tried, but failed to lure Aridin into a trap called the Well of Sorrows. Aridin killed Tarbophon, but the powerful wizard rose again two millennia later as a lich. Under the title of the Whispering Tyrant, Tarbophon seized power in Uslav and united the great orc tribes of the Belskin under his banner. The Whispering Tyrant held central Avastan firmly in his skeletal fist for centuries, raising slain troops to fight as undead warriors. Now, fun fact here about the Whispering Tyrant. Um, for those that don't know anything about lichdom, lichdom, um, in order to become a lich, so lichdom, obviously the practice or attempt to becoming a lich, um, or becoming a lich is, the, the process is called lichdom. Uh, those who are attempting to become lich, uh, you essentially have to make a very deadly brew of very, very, very unique and very rare items, uh, some unique, um, uh, and you have to make a brew, and when you drink it, it kills you. Uh, some some liches drink something that kills them quickly. Some you know drink something that kills them slowly. Tarbophon's intellect is so high that he made a concoction for his lichdom that required his his death to be from a divine creature. Or div like a, a powerful divine creature. And of course, if you're slain by a god, I would say that's a pretty powerful divine creature. And the chances of him coming back were about 2%. But he did. And so when he did, unlike every other lich up until that point who had only been killed by... The serum, their, their, their uh, elixir that they made, uh, or or suicided themselves, only came back so powerful, and he was he was smart enough that he came up with a a, a, a solution that was far beyond anyone's comprehension. Uh, essentially, he was a, I believe, his twentieth level when when but when he died. Uh, so again, this is someone who has like that twenty two intelligence, just way too bright for their own good. But we continue. In 3754, Taldor launched the Shining Crusade to vanquish the Lich King. Its knights of Ozim established the port town of Vilumis as a foothold, and, with the dwarves of Kragodan, fought back the Whispering Tyrant's armies. The Crusaders beseeched Aridin to vanquish his ancient foe, but Aridin sent his herald, Arazni, the Red Crusader, in his stead. The Knight of Ozem rallied behind her, but Arazni fell against the Wizard King and was slain. And, uh, fun fact, he brought her back as an undead just to spit in Aradin's face because that's how lovely Tarbophon is. So, outraged, the Knights of Ozem redoubled their efforts. Routing the orc hordes and pushing the whispering tyrant back to his city of Adorak. Or, yeah, to his city of Adorak. There, the valiant General Arnesant faced the whispering tyrant in single combat. The overconfident Lich casually wished, casted the wish spell, for the General's heart to fly into his hand. I mean, granted, you could do that in. First edition, you cannot do that in second edition. Um, but Arnesant was protected by a shield crafted by Aridin himself. The shield absorbed Tarbophon's magic, shattering it, shattering it into a dozen pieces. One of the pieces embedded, embedded itself in the Whispering Tyrant's hand, burning his undead flesh with its life-giving energy. The weakened Lich retreated into his fortress, called the Gallows Spire where the Crusaders, too exhausted to pursue, sealed him within, using powerful magic wards. The Crusaders named the lands surrounding their former base of operations Last Wall, establishing themselves there as watchers of the Whispering Tyrant's prisons, prison and defenders against Belskin. The nation of Uslav was, Uslav was free at last, 
although it never recovered the vigor that Tar Buffon had stolen from it. Yet the Whispering Tyrant plotted within his prison. <clears throat> he learned that he could use the shard still lodged in his hand as a devastating weapon. Remotely detonating the other shards of the Shattered Shield, his agents, a group of necromancers and death cultists known as the Whispering Way, stole the shards and placed them in key sites, including Last Wall's capital of Vigil and the shadowed halls of the Gallows Spire. The Gallows Spire's explosion cracked the Crusader's great seal and freed the Whispering Tyrant. After setting loose hordes of undead across Last Wall, now known as the Gravelands. The Lich moved against Absalom, determined to seize the power of the Star Stone for himself. Powerful heroes sacrificed themselves to detonate the shard in Tarbophon's own hand, staining the area now known as the Tyrant's Grasp with his necromatic power, but forcing the Whispering Tyrant back to his phylactery on the Isle of Terror. The Whispering Tyrant now amasses his undead armies and prepares to ravage Avistan anew. Fun fact, um, Paizo has uh, hinted and announced, not fully announced obviously, but hinted at a adventure path that will once and for all bring down the Whispering Tyrant. Looking forward to it, Paizo, I hope it's coming! We now move into Belzken. Cartographers may designate the lands between the Tusk Mountains, the Kodar Mountains, and the Mindspin Mountains, Belzken. But there is no such formal nation, and few of its mainly orc residents would deem it a place name. To them, Belzken is the name of a legendary hero, an orc warlord. <clears throat> who united the tribes in the area and conquered the dwarven sky citadel of Kol Dukar more than 8,000 years ago. Belzken renamed the city Urgir, and it remains the largest city in the region by far. Although, although Belzken's alliance collapsed after his death, fracturing the orcs into dozens of feuding tribes, Urgir remains a symbol of power to them, and despite constant turnovers in leadership, the city has continued to grow. Clever and far-sighted warlord named Grask Uldeth, chieftain of the Empty Hand tribe, saw the economic benefits under nations em enjoyed and sought to bring them to Urgir by means other than simply stealing them. Uldeth created a system of tokens allowing non-orcs to travel through Belskin freely in exchange for tribute payments. Encourage merchants to relocate to Ulg Urgir with light taxes and complete indifference to unscrupulous wares. And ensure their protection in the city with a rudimentary police force called the Closed Fist. Uldeth was slain by a mysterious assassin in 4716. And his steward, Ardax the Whitehair, now serves as the overlord of Urgir. Urgir, excuse me. <clears throat> Ardax leads the closed fist, but not with empty hand, uh, which has given him more time to coordinate improvements to the city. Chief among these has been the discovery of several caches of dwarven weapons underneath the city, along with huge herd of rust monsters. Is, I think it's meant, along with a huge herd of of rust monsters that now patrol with the closed fist like trained dogs. When the whispering tyrant broke free from Gallows Spire, he sent several envoys to regain the allegiances of the Orc hordes, just as he had fifteen centuries ago. The tribes the tribes of Belskin remembered what happened to their ancestors under Tarbafon. However, and this time the orcs refused to fight and die for the Lich King. The orcs slaughtered the undead envoys as an, answered, as an answer and mounted the envoys' heads along the walls of Urgir. 
The Whispering Tyrant was enraged by this defiance, sending an army of undead to cow the orcs into response. In the battle of in the battle of nine broken skulls outside of Erdir, Ardax led a desperate coalition of orc tribes to victory over this undead army. The Whispering Tyrant had sought to break the orcs' morale, but he succeeded only in teaching them how much stronger they could be together. The orcs know it's only a matter of time before the Whispering Tyrant sends another large force or marches to Urgir personally. While even the most stubborn of the tribes have conceded, they must solidify into a united front to repel this in, uh, incipient, incipient threat. <clears throat> Cut. While even the most stubborn of tribes have conceded, they must solidify into a united front to repel this incipient threat. They struggle to overcome a long history of strife. Belskin's land is harsh and unyielding. Cut. Belskin's land is harsh, harsh and unyielding, and it receives little rain except during the spring floods that turn the region's largest thoroughfare, the Flood Road, in, uh, from a wide dry valley into a river. The Orc tribes now struggle to work together to share the resources of their hard land and fiercely debate whether to reach out to long despised neighbors for aid against the Whispering Tyrant's wrath. Orcs who aren't warriors have used this trying time to gain influence and prestige both due to their skills at managing resources and their relative neutrality in orc tribal grudges. For the first time in millennia, Belskin's orcs value caretakers, artisans, and negotiators, not just warriors. Next we have the Fangwood Forest. The Fangwood is an ancient forest, populated by fae in the ages before Earthfall. When dwarves and Kellid wanderers discovered the Fangwood, they found it rich in resources. The Fae, disturbed by these unfriendly intruders, rallied behind Gendwin, an ancient, powerful, and capricious Fae noble. Gendwin used guile and trickery to repel the intruders, and before long, the dwarves had withdrawn, and the Kellid settlers declared the forest taboo. Gendwin then reached out to her chastened neighbors, forming strong alliances that lasted for thousands of years. Yet treachery lurks even among the Fae, and one of Gendwin's handmaidens, Arlantia, had secretly devoted herself to Chith Vusug, the demon lord of fungus and parasites. In 4062, over 200 years after the end of the Shining Crusade, Arlantia overthrew and imprisoned Gendwin before releasing a terrible plague throughout the northern Fangwood, a supernatural infection called the Dark Blight. This plague spread quickly among the Fae, wrapping their features and twisting their souls. The Dark Blight's expansion was slowed by Nermathai scouts in the Fangwood, who fought to protect their forest homes from the infection, and finally ended in 4717, when heroes from Nermathai slew Orlantia and freed Genduin from her imprisonment. Today, Genduin rules from her Acrisial Palace in the heart of the Fangwood, but her rule is far from secure. Pockets of the Dark Blight remain, and the dense northern section of the Fangwood is home to orcs, dragons, and other threats that murder Fae on sight. Keenly aware of her need for allies, Gendwin has re-established relations with the Nermathai and the Druids of the Crystal Hearst, particularly the scouts and freedom fighters called the Chernasardo Rangers. Still, relations between the fractitious humans and fickle fae are strained even at the best, even at the best of times, and both sides welcome intermediaries skilled with negotiation or primal magic. Next we have the Gravelands. 
Founded in the wake of the Shining Crusade, the land formerly known as Lastwall was a nation of knights who swore to watch over the Whispering Tyrant's prison, the Tower of Gallows Spire. The Crusaders established the mighty walled capital of Vigil and the gleaming white port city of Volumis. Although the Crusaders still found purpose in fighting to contain the Orcs of Belskin, Many knights believe their organization's glory days were behind them. Their vigilance and zeal gradually dwindled. Meanwhile, the Whispering Tyrant plotted his escape and eventually developed the destructive weapon known as the Radiant Fire. In the devastating summer of 4719, Tarbafon obliterated the village of Rossler's Coffer and the Crusader capital of Vigil. At the same time, Whispering Way cells throughout Last Wall synchronized murders, arson, and undead risings that shattered the nation. In one season, Last Wall was broken. Last Wall's ruler, Watcher Lord Ulthun II, was forced to retreat to Absalom. Last Wall's most influential priest, Iluna Varvatos, leads recently arrived. Magambian philanthropist, and the stone-faced crusaders who organized daily evacuations aboard ships departing Volumis. The remnants of Last Wall are now known as the Greyblins. Hordes of undead roam the countryside, their movements coordinated by Tarbafon's loyal officers. Goblin tribes and those few orcs who chose to ally themselves with the Whispering Tyrant now travel openly within the nation's former borders. Most of Last Wall's population has already fled, and only the truly desperate remain huddled in crumbling strongholds or in failing farms. To travel openly across the Gravelands is to court death. But the surviving Knights of Ozim, now called the Knights of Last Wall, seek to stem the tide of evil, even in the face of incredible odds. Legendary Crusader fortresses, fortresses such as Castle Everstand and Castle Farina, uh, Firina, stand empty, abandoned, when their defenders could no longer count on supplies or support. These castles still stand tall on rolling hills, each as empty and grim as a tomb. Lake and Carthen and the Isle of Terror. Lake and Carthen is one of the most heavily traveled bodies of water on Galarian, with regular shipping along its coasts. Four national capitals sit on Lake and Carthen's shores: Caliphus of Ustalov, Curse of Druma. Tamron of Nermathos and Throne Step of Razmaran, and several other key cities besides, such as the Molthuni naval city of Erinmas and Kionin's port of Greengold. Although the lake harbors pirates and monsters, the opportunity for profit makes navigating its waters worth the risks. Today, Lake and Carthen is more dangerous than ever due to the Whispering Tyrant's activity on and around the Isle of Terror. This large island at the lake's center was never a place visited by the sensible. Strange storms whipped the lake for miles around it, and the island's rocky shores provided few safe places to anchor. Now that the Whispering Tyrant has returned, the negative energy storms around the island roil constantly and the island contains an ever greater undead presence. Unlike in the Graveland, where mobs of undead roam under the guidance of undead officers or whispering way necromancers, the undead on the Isle of Terror are almost all powerful individuals who serve in Tarbafon's courts and aid him in his plot to scour the lands of the living. Flying and swimming undead range further than ever before sometimes as far as coastal settlements settlements excuse me powerful adventurers willing to brave the isle of terror have only one relatively reasonable harbor the bay around fort landing 
once a fortress marking the road to Tarbophon's underground city, Fort Landing stands on the white sand beaches at the mouth of the Whispering River. The river's dark, poisonous waters flow down from the Three Furies, the mountain range, and the island's heart. Deep in the Three Furies yawn the Wizard King's pit and its well of sorrows, a trap that Tarbophon set for Aridin millennia ago. The trap is rumored to still be active, and poised to snare careless explorers. Not all inhabitants of the Isle of Terror are beholden to the Whispering Tyrant. The terror wolves that prowl the island's uh, forests are a threat to any travelers, and the living trees in the Shadow's Heart forest bear a passionate animosity towards all intruders. The powerful undead dragon, dragon named Karamoros hides on the island, fuming and plotting. Karamoros had planned to murder Tarbophon due to an old vendetta, but her hasty attack on the returning whispering tyrant led to a humiliating rue. Although Karamoros and her minions, the whisper scale lizard folk, might serve as allies for those who wish to confront the whispering tyrant, she is every bit as crafty and as wicked as her enemy. The Isle of Terror fades in and out of cosmic alignment with the negative energy plane, and entire sections of the island become overwhelmed by the void of that empty, life-hating realm. During this alignment, creatures can step out of the negative energy plane and onto the island, where the Whispering Tyrant presses them into service. The lands touched by this joining can take decades to recover. Molthoon, the imperialistic and territorial nation of Molthoon was merely a province of Chiliax until it declared its independence and its willingness to fight to keep its sovereignty in 4632 AR. To solidify control within its borders, the Molthoonian established a military oligarchy of nine general lords and created a burdensome series of taxes to fund a standing army. With the, uh, while the elite in the southern cities of Canorat and Korholm benefited from these measures, the northern territories found the tax, taxes onerous and 4655 AR rebelled to form the fiercely independent nation of Nermathos. Since then, Malthun has warred with Nermathos to reclaim its lost territory, with the conflict alternating between bloody combat and uneasy ceasefire. This dynamic has changed only recently with the creation of the new hobgoblin nation of Opruk and the reemergence of the Whispering Tyrant, which have forced Malthun to cool many of its military operations on the Nermathai border. The crushing defeat of northern Malthun's forces by the hobgoblin general Azerci, though officially derided as the fault of the commander in charge and not a reflection of Malthun as a whole, caused a great deal of soul searching and finger pointing among the higher echelons of Malthun's government. The rise of the Whispering Tyrant has widened these divisions further. As some generals recognize, the current threat requires alliances to survive, while other generals believe that crushing Nermathos, Oprak, and Tarbophon single-handedly is the only way to gain, regain face after being humiliated. Pragmatic-minded Molthuni diplomats and merchants have been making tenuous connections, while their counterparts in Nermathos, although bellicose spies and saboteurs frequently infiltrate these delegations. Only time will tell if Molthun will ally with the other nations against the Whispering Tyrant, or doom the entire region out of pride and short-sightedness. Short-sightedness, excuse me. Residents of Molthun have traditionally been divided into imperial citizens and indentured laborers. Although indentured laborers cannot vote and have their travel and trade limited to specific regions within the nation, they can, as of 4710, 
ascend to citizenship within five years of military service or some other regulated service to the state. Immigrants are also eligible, and last wall refugees have flocked to Molthoon as a result. Proof of earned citizenship comes in the form of a large coin with a number and the red flag of Molthoon upon it. Those who have earned the red coin are often unpopular with the aristocratic elite, but have swelled the ranks of the Molthoonian military forces. Molthoon also makes use of its mercenary companies, both human and monstrous. Though its practice has come under heavy criticism under General Azerci, uh, has made use of Molthoon's resources to raise the Iron Fang Legion and start the Iron Fang invasion. Despite its militaristic leadership, Molthoon pursues diplomatic relations with those neighbors it cannot easily subjugate including the powerful Druma and the Chiliac's back nation of Iskra. Only the foolish mistake this diplomacy for peace. However, as Molthun is quick to pounce on opportunities to fuel its expansionist agenda. Nermathos. The people of Nermathos have always been fiercely independent, willing to fight and die to protect the freedoms they've claimed. Once part of Molthun, the forest folk saw the fruits of their labors claimed by the elites in Kenorit and decided they'd have enough of domination. They first enacted work stoppages and sabotage, but ultimately took up an outright rebellion to claim their independence. The crafty Wugs folk fought the armies of Molthun to a standstill and established themselves as an independent nation under the charismatic leader Irgal Nirmath in 4655. When Nirmath, when Nirmath was assassinated on the same day the nation was founded, the rebels named their country's country Nirmathos in his honor. Nirmathos has suffered many blows over the past last decade, from Molthun's draining military offenses to the devastating Iron Fang invasion perpetrated by General Azerci though both nations suffered from the consequences of the conquest of the Iron Fang Legion. Nermathos bore the brunt of the Hobgoblin's cruelties. Now the destruction of Last Wall and incursion of the Whispering Tyrant's undead forces have put Nermathos in a keenly precarious position. The nation is managing to survive due to the strong, experienced militia that was forged during the Iron Fang invasion and the influx of well-trained refugee knights from Last Wall, as well as the fact that the war between Nermathos and Molthun has cooled due to external threats. There is even talk of diplomacy with Molthun and Oprak, though resentment from previous wars and justified fears about military reprisals cause opposition to proposals of alliances with these nations. Nermathos's government is loose at best. As, individ as individual Nermathai settlements chafe at being subject to any laws but their own. Prominent Nermathai meet every four years to elect a forest marshal to lead the nation's military and guide its foreign relations. The Nermathai harvest resources from the Fangwood Forest and the Mine Spin Mountains, but they know to take no more than the land can spare. This has resulted in good relations and the unwritten alliance between Nermathos and the citizens of the forest. Nowhere is there more evident than in the town of Crystalhurst, an ancient settlement in the Fangwood. The druids of Crystalhurst consider themselves residents of the Fangwood rather than Nermathos, but they are quick to aid the Nermathai when the nation is in need. There's a subsection of Krogodon. The Sky Citadel of Krogodon, a towering stronghold that sits inside Nermathus' borders but operates as an independent city-state and has existed for nearly ten millennia. Remarkably reclusive, the dwarves of Krogodon have broken with their isolationist tendencies only once in recorded history. 
to march against the Whispering Tyrant. The residents of Nermathos wonder if they can rely on the dwarves once again now that the Whispering Tyrant has returned. More dwarves than usual have been spotted exiting the isolated city, but the, the, but the significance of this is yet unknown. Or yet known, excuse me. <laughs> Oprak, one of Avastan's newest nations. Oprak's nationhood was hard won by the Iron Fang Legion, a hobgoblin army that scoured, scourged northern Malthun and southern Nermathos throughout 4717. Its leader, General Azerse, first rose to prominence as the commander of one of Malthun's non-human mercenary companies. She patiently attracted hobgoblins and other monstrous mercenaries to her side, ultimately swelling her troop into an army. When she had taken all of the recruits Molthun could offer, she broke with Molthun and led her army into Nermathos. With the aid of a powerful artifact called the Onyx Key, Azerse and her troops made their base in a strange castle deep within the Plain of Earth, called the Vault of the Onyx Citadel. From there, she could create dimensional pathways to any location she chose, allowing the Iron Fang Legion to move supplies and troops with ease. Azerse's legion rapidly conquered much of the southwestern Nermathos, and she would have extended her domain further if a group of heroes had not raised a militia to halt her advance. Exhausted by the toll the war had taken on her army, her friendships, and herself, Azerse elected to withdraw her troops into the mountains, mountains and use the Onyx Citadel to establish Oprak as a homeland for hobgoblins and other creatures seen as monsters. Azerse carved her lands on Galarian from a sparsely inhabited section of the Minespin Mountains between Nermathos and Nidal. The general and her advisors, the Enclave Council, were careful when drawing their borders to exclude the dwarven free city of Krogodon. But Azerse, but Azerse all but dared her neighbors to contest her claim. Representatives from the Umbral Court of Nidal were the first to meet with Azerse and acknowledge the Hobgoblin General's sovereignty, agreeing to a three-year non-aggression pact. Shortly thereafter, Forest Marshal Dardina Yawis of Nermathos approached Azerse under heavy guard to discuss diplomatic relations and agreed to peace for four years. Yawis hopes that because the hobgoblins are scheduled to end their peace with Nidal first, they will look west rather than east for military conquest. General Azerse maintains the military arm of her nation still called the Iron Fang Legion, but has solidly shifted her nation's focus to develop a robust economy. Due to the extraplanar nature of the Onyx Citadel, Oprak is currently the safest nation in the region from the threat of the Whispering Tyrant, and Azerse is currently avoiding military conflict in order to fully develop her new homeland's resources and tactical advantages. Hobgoblins and other creatures willing to serve as explorers, miners, smiths, and alchemists have been flocking into this fledgling, fledgling, fledgling nation. Although Oprak is little more than 300 miles across and consists primarily of forbidding mountains, and hobgo the hobgoblins have substantially more resources than they have revealed to the rest of the world. The Onyx Citadel rests in a large verdant, ca verdant cavern that the hobgoblins call the Onyx Vault, which is even larger than the territory Azerse claims on Galarian. Created long ago by a powerful species of terraformers called Xeomorns, the Onyx Vault has a variety of terrain, its own day and night cycle, and even clouds and rain. The hobgoblins and industriously 
taming this strange land, negotiating with powerful and elemental natives, and mining the profusion of gems and ores from this wondrous place. Galarian's connections to the Onyx Citadel, paths known as the Stone Roads, are guarded by legions of watchful hobgoblins. Five such entrances exist throughout the mountains of Oprak, the largest being the Obsidian Tower in the new capital, Hunthal's Heart. Azerti's diplomats have placed another in the militaristic Hoblin nation of Kaoling in Tian Xia, and have opened diplomatic relations with that nation. Last but not least, my favorite in this region, at least, Ustalav. An ancient, mist-shrouded land, Ustalav is steeped in thousands of years of civil wars, shadowy horrors, selfish rulers, and deadly conspiracies. Ustalav has many enemies, but only its most visible foes. Dangerous undead and Numerian aggressors are external. Internally, the nation suffers from infighting among its decaying aristocracy, serial killers who keep to the shadows, and monsters clever enough to masquerade as humans. The land is divided into three regions, each with a markedly different history. Although looming mountains, misty forests, and dark lakes can be found everywhere in Uslav, the character of the local population makes each region seem very different from the others. The heartland of Usalav, Soivoda, contains the bulk of the nation's population and its three biggest cities. Usalav's capital, Caliphus, is a fog-shrouded port on Lake Incarthen, whose residents tend to be more cosmopolitan than the isolated people found elsewhere in Soivoda. Caliphus has always had a problem with overcrowding, but last while refugees pouring into the city have created a full-scale crisis. Local groups calling themselves the Haven Guard Greeters roam the streets with clubs and blades, purportedly turning squatters out of alleys and parks, but eventually indulging their bloodlust and calling it civic duty. The refugees have few options elsewhere in Soivoda, though, as the countryside harbors wolves, bears, and other beasts, and the insular Uslavs, outs Uslavs outside the ca of Caliphus often greet strangers with torches and pitchforks. The three northwestern counties in Uslav overthrew their hereditary rulers in 4674, and instituted a parliamentary rule of elected commoners. This region now known as the Palatinates uh, and is an area of innovative ideals and cutting-edge science. Doctors, alchemists, and academies, particularly at the prestigious University of Leipzigstadt, and making startling discoveries in anatomy, medicine, and other sciences. Although some condemn these scientists as dangerous or even depraved, their adversaries are undeniable. More recently, the advanced technologies have made their way from Numeria through black markets and into the laboratories of Leipzigstadt, allowing monumental breakthrough in the fields of clockwork automation, electricity, and steam power, among others. Many wouldn't call the haunted land in the southwest known as Verlich, a part of Uslav at all. Certainly, sensible Uslavs shun the former domain of the Whispering Tyrant and the area where his prison of Galaspire loomed over the countryside for centuries. The land of Verlich is gloomy and inhabited and uninhabited, save for the predatory monsters roaming undead and a few hard scrabble settlers. The unnatural storms that plague the area are just one manifestation of nature gone wrong, warped by the Whispering Tyrant's necromantic magic. A place of deadly, verdant profusion called the Gallow Garden surrounds the blasted crater 
where the gallows spire once stood, a dense, mutated forest uh, as a blasted wasteland. Although the whispering tyrant is now absent, uncounted terror still lingers on. We're now going to go ahead and move into the backgrounds available if you're from this region. We first have the Belskin Slayer. You are a fearsome warrior from the hold of Belskin, and your clan counts on you for support, counsel, and defense. With the rising threat of the Whispering Tyrant threatening the safety of your home, you must not let your people down. Choose two ability boosts. One must be strength or charisma, and one is a free boost. I definitely agree with these two. You're trained in intimidation and the orc lore skill, and you gain the intimidation, intimidating glare skill feat. This is wonderful. I would just say, if you're going to be from Bellskin, probably going to be human, half-orc, or orc. Anything other than that would be really weird. That's just me, though. Next, we have the Cursed Family. Rumors abound your family. Rumors abound that your family is cursed. While that would explain several unfortunate events in your family history, you may or may not believe it. Regardless, odd coincidences plague your lineage and perhaps even appear in your own life. And you have become used to spotting strangeness all around you. Choose two ability boosts. One must be intelligence or charisma. I agree, and one's free. You're trained in occultism, I definitely agree. And the curse lore skill, you gain the oddity identification skill feat. Mm, skill feat could be different, but that's just me. The last wall survivor. You managed to escape the devastation that the Whispering Tyrant brought to your nation. But you lost everything to the Lich King's minions including your home and many friends and family. Choose two ability boosts. One must be constitution or wisdom. And one is a free ability boost. I actually agree with this. Lots of clerics in uh, Last Wall 2. You trained in the medicine skill. You're trained in the medicine skill and the undead lore skill. You gain the battle medicine skill feat. Could not agree more. Molthuni mercenary background. Whether you sought citizenship or simply needed a steady paycheck, you spent some of your time as a paid mercenary in the armed forces of Molthun, where you fought against Molthun's enemies, such as Nermathos or the Iron Fang Legion. Alternatively, you might have worked at sea, protecting Molthun's military and trading ships amongst pirates on Lake and Carthen. Choose two ability boosts. One must be strength or constitution, and one is a free ability boost. I definitely agree. I think Dex is, an, is not really fitting here. Molthun is very into uh, like plate-wielding warriors, so Dex would be really weird. <clears throat> you're trained in athletics and mercenary, and you gain experience professional. I mean, if you're a mercenary, you might as well be good at it. So I have to 100% agree. The Nermathai Gorilla. Woodcraft comes naturally to you, and you have learned how to use it in the forest to your tactical advantage against superior forces in skirmishes against the Molthuni army or the Iron Fang Legion. Choose two ability boosts. One must be dexterity or wisdom, and one is a free ability boost. You're trained in the survival skill and the forest lore skill. You gain the terrain stalker, underbrush, skill feat. Onyx Trader. Oprak doesn't share the secrets of the Onyx Vault with many, but you are one of the lucky few to be permitted to the heart of the nation. You have traveled the extra-dimensional extra paths of the stone roads and traded goods across a wide variety of lands. You've learned to step lively in foreign markets of all types. Choose two ability boosts. One must be dexterity or charisma, and one is a free ability boost. You're trained in the society skill and the mercantile lore skill. You gain the multilingual skill feat. I should like this a lot. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. The Ustalov Academic. You were educated at a far famed Ustalovic Academy, such as the University of Leibstadt, 
or the Cinco Macti School of Sciences and receive quality instruction in advanced concepts of mathematic, science, and engineering. Choose two ability boosts. One must be intelligence, or I would say intelligence. If you choose wisdom, you're weird. Other than, I guess, maybe the nature side of Trojan, I guess? You're trained in the crafting skill and the academia lore skill. You gain the skill training skill feat. Now, if you were an alchemist, I would... Never mind. I, I would ask for specialty crafting, although that might be a bit... I don't think, uh, yeah, no, you can't use specialty crafting to level 2 anyway. Never mind. Last but not least, the Whispering Way Scion. Your family has long been associated with the enigmatic death cult known as the Whispering Way, which has recently, which was recently responsible for the terrible devastation in the nation of Last Wall. Whether or not you have followed in their footsteps, you know many of the philosophy's secrets. Choose two ability boosts. One must be intelligence or wisdom, and one is a free, int uh, free ability boost. You're trained in the religion skill and the undead lore skill. You gain student of the canon skill feat. I like it. I actually like it a lot. <clears throat> and the last but not least thing we have in the region of the Eye of Dread is the Last Wall Century archetype. All the nation of Last Wall is gone, leaving only the horror of the Gravelands behind. You refuse to give up and renounce your oaths. You have renewed your vows, swearing to combat the influence of the Whispering Tyrant, wherever it might strike across Galeria. The Last Wall Sentry Dedication. You have sworn yourself as a sentry for the Knights of Last Wall, the first line of defense against incursions by the Whispering Tyrant throughout Galarian. You become trained in athletics and in undead lore. If you are already trained, you become expert instead. Finally, you regain the reactive shield fighter feat. I'm just going to say this right now. If you are a champion and you have access to this, one thing that's always made me a little upset <coughs> excuse me, about the champion is unlike the fighter, they do not get reflexive shield. A reactive shield which is crazy because they are like shield and armor masters this is how you can get it boom next the eye of ozim again you must have the dedication and you must be expert in perception a level four Woo! hope you're a fighter or a rogue or something like that oh my goodness You've learned how to spot danger at a distance, allowing you to serve as a sentry with ease. You gain a plus two circumstance bonus to initiative rolls when using perception. And when you're scouting, you're, uh, you grant your allies a plus two bonus instead of one. Dig it. Necromantic resistance. As part of your training, you, you've injured yourself against necromantic a, necro a necromancy through repeated exposure. You gain a plus one circumstance bonus to save against necromancy effects and gain resistance to negative damage equal to half your level. It's really good. Grave Sense. There's a lot of necromancy in Pathfinder, so that's actually really good. Grave Sense. Level six. You've spent your time hunting the undead, uh, and this allows you to sense them. You gain. You, you sense undead as a vague sense. Similar to humans, sense of smell or uncomfortable sensation akin to smelling something cloying and rotting. When in proximity to the undead, you eventually sense their presence. Though it might not happen instantly, you can, you, uh, and you can't pinpoint their location. An undead using a disguise or otherwise trying to hide its presence must attempt a deception DC against your perception DC. To hide its presence from you. If the creature succeeds at this deception check, then it's temporary, temporarily immune to your grave sense for an entire day. I can see a really, 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 really cool, um, uh, how I put this, a cool, um, moment, you know, just because of how the scaling works. 
in Pathfinder, I could see like a, uh, you know, one of those, I guess you can call it like a mentor betrayer or like a trusted NPC betrayer where you have this NPC who is like this quest giver or this, you know, person that the, the party interacts with at lower levels. And then right before they leave the town, because they're finally high enough to start rolling those checks to succeed, all of a sudden, the paladin or the or the last wall sentry finds out that they're undead. It'd be pretty cool. Pretty cool. Necromantic tenacity. Level eight. Your training against necromantic effects. Oh, and this, you have to take necromantic resistance for this. Uh, allows you to escape the worst of their touch. If you roll a success on a saving throw against any necromancy effect, you get a critical success instead. If you get a critical failure, you only get failure. Bye-bye, phantasmal killer. Can't kill you. That's pretty great. So... Um, Last Wall Warden, level 10. Uh, Last Wall Sentry Dedication. You use your shield to protect your allies, not just yourself, especially against the undead. When you have your shield raised, you can use your shield block reaction when an attack is made against an ally adjacent to you, in addition to its usual trigger. If you do, the shield prevents that ally from taking damage instead of you, following the normal rules for shield block. If an undead makes an attack against an ally within 10 feet, you can step to become adjacent to your ally and then use your shield block as part of the same reaction. That's even better than the, the standard champion extra reaction block. That's actually really, 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 really good. Uh, granted, you need to be playing an undead campaign for that to even be useful. But... That is going to conclude it for the Eye of Dread. Thanks for joining me today. And if you like what you what you heard today, again, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If you're returning and you already are Cardinal by subscribing, use that beak, peck that bell so you can get updated whenever anything goes live. And again, I am so sorry it took this long to get this uh, where in the world out i got a bit hung up on the idea of the cardinal chronicles it took me a little longer to edit than i'd like to admit but it was a good time and it turned out really really cool um but i'm gonna try starting to, i'm gonna start using the those kind of effects and stuff in these videos too as you saw today so um that'll be that and uh thanks for joining me and i'll see you guys in the next video Bye-bye.